have a panel, but I don't think it's just this panel, but the entire round table here. So we do hope we're going to have an engaging and open conversation with everyone today. By way of quick introduction of what this is, what this session is supposed to be about. As you all know, by today, cyberspace has become an intrinsic part of the development of every country, creating enormous opportunities and enabling everything from distance learning to innovation and social and economic growth. Secure, trusted and inclusive digital infrastructure is the backbone of today's economic and social development. With just over half of the world's population connected to the internet, closing the digital divide is essential to reducing inequalities and socioeconomic gaps between those with access to digital services and those without. However, this rapid digitalization comes with collateral risks as well, including in low and middle income countries that may lack adequate cyber resilience against constantly evolving digital threats. These growing vulnerabilities and disproportionate cyber hygiene across sectors and geographies often fall short in tackling the frequency and intensity of cyber attacks, making this a truly global challenge. This tension, if you will, between the need for digital transformation versus the lack of strong cybersecurity posture can be considered a risk toward achieving the sustainable development goals and a threat to achieving safe, secure and rights respecting online environment. While doing more to increase the resilience of digital infrastructure is absolutely necessary, it is not sufficient to break growing trends in, and um, decrease the cyber threats that businesses and societies are facing every day. Thankfully, we have ample ground to build on. Most states and international organizations have affirmed that existing international law, and especially the UN Charter in its entirety, applies to the use of the ICTs by states. States have also agreed on norms for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Translating these agreements, these existing norms, into feasible actions that halt growing trends of cyber threats on business communities and governments worldwide is what is needed, and it's long overdue. Furthermore, to empower and protect societies from increased cybersecurity risks associated with digital transformation, the international community should explore practical ways to mainstream cybersecurity capacity building into broader digital development efforts. This is also essential for building resilient societies and promoting a whole of society approach to dealing with threats emanating from cyberspace. So mainstreaming cybersecurity into digital development we feel will leverage its resilience mechanisms supporting a safe digital transformation and thus a better and more sustainable future for all. It is in this context that the International Chamber of Commerce convenes this session to discuss global multi-stakeholder processes to agree and adopt so-called cybersecurity development goals. In this session with you all together and with the present panel, we'll like to present this proposal for cyber development goals and gather perspectives from all of you on what such a list of goals could look like and what is the process to develop them. This session thus aims to kickstart a continuous dialogue and stimulate collaborative input from the international multi-stakeholder community, which is what the IGF is all about. So before further ado, and I promise you won't hear this much from me during this session, um, I would like to, to give the floor to, my, to our speakers. And I'd like to start with um, Grace here to my left to ask you, um, what do you feel about the current situation of cyberspace, the current acquis of cyber norms and laws, um, and what would you be, what would be your recommendations on bolstering capacity building to implement this framework? And we'll have five minutes for you to speak. You can stop this one. And I'm going to close. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Actually, I'm stepping in for someone else who was supposed to be here. Um, uh, but I believe I can still speak into the issues. So in terms of um, uh, cybersecurity approaches, uh, what has been going on, there are different efforts at different levels. And uh, some of them, are, like the moderator has highlighted, uh, include efforts like this where people come together during the IGF. And uh, IGF, of course, is seen as a multi-stakeholder approach where different voices uh, come together to uh, uh, dialogue on an issue and articulate their perspectives. And so IGF remains one of those uh, platforms that uh, can be used to discuss 
cyber security uh, measures. Uh, the other um, process that's happening right now is the open-ended uh, working group where uh, different governments are gather, you know, gathered to discuss this. And uh, recently they've also allowed uh, you know, other stakeholders like the businesses and civil society to also come in and make statements. And uh, so what, what I would say is that uh, when, when we are discussing about cybersecurity, um, uh, the, it is very important to actually employ uh, multi-stakeholder approaches because we have seen that cyber security cuts across everyone. Everyone, especially who is a user of any gadget uh, or any device, uh, is prone to you know cyber attack and this is the you know this person or this institution then needs to be involved in this dialogue so that we come up with the with the measures so in terms of what uh, is being proposed uh, for example i just like the expected outcomes uh, because uh, you know they are good they are ideal and um, they they express uh, great aspirations of what we expect in terms of uh, cyber, uh, cyber, um, you know, cyber security dialogues and measures. Um, but my only concern is uh, we need to be very clear who who is, um, you know, who is proposing uh, these uh, measures because we have seen if you don't get it right from the word go issues of trust come in and if a process lacks trust from the word go then it loses credibility and so who is proposing this is it the businesses is it civil society and therefore we need to consider a multi-stakeholder approach and this is why this such a meeting is very good because then you'll be presenting and getting a buy-in from from the rest of the of, of the people in here um the other thing is when we pro you know when we adopt a multi-stakeholder approach how are we going to involve the stakeholders so we need to be very clear on on how this involvement is going to happen are we going to select representatives from the different uh, stakeholders to actually articulate what is important and then uh, you know cyber security development goals needs to cut across uh, needs to cut to cut across practically every aspect of our lives and uh, so that we are not just looking at security we are also looking at development so that for us to development then uh, what needs to be done to reduce the cyber security issues and then I have highlighted that trust is very critical in such a process um, you know we need to think through the issue of trust because this is what uh, undermines good processes and therefore uh, we need to be very clear uh, what are some of these trust issues uh, and deal with them in you know at this stage um, and then of course um, for me the last point I know before you tell me my time is over mm -hmm. there is the issue of cyber hygiene and uh, so we all tend to talk about cyber security cyber security this cyber security that and we forget that cyber attacks come you know they come to gadgets but they come to systems but they also come to users and users might not necessarily be like us who are sitting uh, in this room who are lucky to be discussing what are those uh, what are those uh, uh, critical aspects of cyber security and so we must start mainstreaming cyber hygiene into this cyber security conversations because it's ordinary people who are affected and it's ordinary people that we need to start embracing cyber hygiene practices so that they are also able you know to to understand because we talk of capacity building needs ordinary people also need to start understanding how cyber security affects them and how they can contribute into the processes and actually ensure that we all you know are attempting and uh, and moving towards a secure and safe space online thank you it's off i'm going to use yours because mine is not working <laughs>
Thank you, Grace, for that introduction. Um, and you've highlighted, I think, some of the running themes that we will like to unpack throughout this session. So um, very much looking forward to everyone's contributions. But you've mentioned um, processes that are ongoing at the UN, at the Open-Ended Working Group. Um, there's also the process to, to develop a cybercrime convention and uh, um, ad hoc committee on cybercrime in Vienna. Um, we've mentioned uh, already the applicability of international law and the, the great work that has been done in the previous GGEs as well. Um, so against this landscape and against this um, list of aspirations and, and modalities and involvement and inclusion uh, that you've mentioned, um, what is it that cyber development goals could do, Rene? What do you think um, this this current state of implementation of, of the, the existing norms and their key, um, how does that fit with the cyber development goals structure and what is this really that we are presenting here for discussion?
this to happen, we as ICC will uh, convene a multi-stakeholder coalition of interested governments and international organizations, businesses, civil society and technical organization because we believe that we need to do this together. So if there is anything I would like to end off with uh, in terms of calling for action is that uh, we try to endorse the need for a collective action with the purpose to have a global multi-stakeholder process that aims to agree on what the goal should be and how to go forward to adopt those cyber development goals. I think I stop here. Thank you very much, Rene. Um, and these two interventions really conclude what we meant. We, we wanted to put forward as a as a backgrounder for discussion. Um, we've heard uh, from from Grace what would be the aspirations for cyber development goals, the need that we need to work together on these, the need that we um, need to talk about not just the technical issues but also the developmental issues and the way we translate. Uh, goals that, that are sometimes very high level and very technical into everyday um, clear needs and actions so that um, everyone from the most technical expert to the, the, the lay person understands them. And we've heard from Rene uh, now on, on what is the proposal here at the table um, that we are looking for pulling together a set of aspirational but feasible goals um, that would help rally all of us around the table as an international community, um, everybody in the UN system, um, governments, businesses, civil society uh, around the globe to come together, understand and, and, and those that we need something like this, but then work together to define it. Um, so this is what at the table, this is the background, what we're trying to discuss. So I'm going to turn to my fellow panelists in order um, to ask um, what do they think about this proposal and, and to try and, and give some meat on the bones of, of this on how this could help, how this could uh, not help if they think that, that there might be some pitfalls here. Um, what, are, what, what are the ways forward and if the cyber development goals are something that uh, we want to take forward, what should those include and how do they combine with existing work and efforts because we are not acting in a void, there are a lot of initiatives already uh, afoot. How can the cyber development goals also help um, pull those together or build on the good work that has already been done? So to start out, um, I am going to turn to uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and uh, as I said, Jacqueline is uh, the Clearinghouse Coordinator at the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, which is the premier cybersecurity capacity building organization, in my humble opinion. Uh, so Jacqueline, how do you see the cyber development goals and how can they help mainstream cybersecurity capacity building for, for development? Thank you, Timia. Um, so I think you've addressed uh, what the GFCE does uh, <laughs> and why maybe you might be part of this conversation. But just to give some context um, to the participants in this room today, uh, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is an international uh, platform um, for collaboration and reducing of overlap and duplication of efforts in cyber capacity building ecosystem. We are comprised of over 170 partners and members, including 95 UN member states, um, industry representatives, uh, academia, um, technical groups, uh, civil society. So um, we have been working since 2015 to identify and um, create solid foundation of knowledge and resources on cyber capacity building. Who's doing what? What are they doing? Um, where, you know, where, where are they doing it? Um, and is there coordination amongst those who are already doing to ensure that there is no duplication of efforts, uh, but then to also ensure that there's a collaboration, international, regional collaboration. Um, what we've seen through our work um, and contributions from the members who are out there doing, you know, these initiatives on cyber capacity building specifically, um, it is it's fundamental for us to link cyber capacity building with development because cyber resiliency is an underlying imperative to achieving the sustainable development goals. You cannot think of deploying um, an education or a health system, information system, without thinking about you know, the cyber triad, 
confidentiality, integrity, availability, offset system. You have to build trust with the users. How do you do this? Through cyber resiliency. And you have to think about this as a cross-cutting um, issue, which is not only within Ministry of ICT or telecoms, um, but there is justice involved. There's interior, there is um, infrastructure, there is education, there's health. Um, so going forward and, and thinking about cyber development goals, one of you know, the, the conversations that we have within our network um, is that there are instruments, there are frameworks which already exist, uh, such as the norms um, on responsible behavior um, in cyberspace developed by the UN. Um, but there's a lot more stakeholders that could be contributing to the implementation of those, and they don't know where to start with this. Um, so cyber development goals to us, in our view, um, would be adding to that conversation of coming up with feasible, um, achievable um, goals that we can put out to the worldwide community um, for implementation, for action. Um, governments are already trying to do it, international organizations are trying to do it, but cybersecurity is a complex issue and I think uh, we've referred to it, it is a whole government, it is a whole society issue. Uh, so you have to think about how to address it. Um, cyber development goals are not, you know, uh, they are part of a wider conversation on how we can mainstream cyber capacity building into development and make sure that we are building sustainable economies, sustainable ecosystems um, going forward. Uh, so we're very excited about this. Um, I think, you know, we've Within our community, we've started on some activities, and I think during this conversation, I can share so that I don't prolong my uh, initial thoughts. Um, but you know, cyber development goals is what we see as, especially for private sector contribution, um, um, and even civil society contribution to cyber <coughs> resilience within national, regional, international fora. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, and I, I like that, that last thought, especially uh, on how the cyber development goals have the potential to rally uh, work and, and, um, and efforts, not just at the international level, but we have to make sure that those trickle down into the implementation of national contexts um, and, and to the various actors, um, as you said, in various actors in different parts of governments that might not think that cybersecurity is even their, their work or the part of their job, but it is. Um, and the same uh, um, to the whole of society. So that's something that definitely we are, we are noting. Um, I'm going to uh, turn now to, to David, um, who, as I said, is first secretary in the permanent mission of Canada to the UN in Geneva, um, and our token government representative on this panel, <laughs> but, but uh, um, not, the, not the only government that we are talking, about, talking with about these issues. Um, but what I want to ask you, knowing that, that um, governments are, are engaged heavily in international discussions on cybersecurity in very many different fora, in very many different contexts. So what could an initiative like this bring to, to that? Um, can it help? Um, does it come as duplication? Or um, can it help um, bring some additional perspectives? What, what are your perspectives on that? And thank you, Tamea. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hope, you, hope you're having a great day. You're all awake. It's day three or day two on the schedule. but. Um, let me just quickly introduce myself. Uh, yeah, I'm David. I'm a diplomat. That's about as much as you need to know. I, uh, and you may wonder, like, why I'm here. I'm from Geneva. What am I doing on the IGF on an international panel? Um, I also ask myself that question, too. But the interesting thing is where I sit and the work I do is, is horizontal. So I, I sit on a perch and I attend all kinds of different events, different fora and different processes that cover the gamut of, from digital um, through to cyber. And I think that's uh, crucially, I hope, why I'm here, because uh, the topic today is really about uh, bridging what I would sort of say has been traditionally uh, two solitudes. Uh, there's been a conversation about cybersecurity in one area of the multilateral system, and there's been a discussion about development in an analog sense in a different part of the system, and now we're talking about digital development, which is sort of a blending of the two worlds. Um, and I am going to employ a famously coined statement, which is be sincere, be short, and be seated. So I will keep my remarks short. Um, I've had to endure a few uh, long ones in the last couple of days, so I can appreciate it. Uh, bottom line up front, um, Canada is a strong supporter of the current rules-based international system, and we engage in that manner. We also uphold the current internet system, internet governance model of an open, free, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure 
internet based on dem democratic principles. This is how we engage the system. This is how we are engaging the issue. There are other models, other ways of or organizational models out there that are in competition with this, but this is what Canada supports. This is what Canada promotes. We uphold the, the United Nations Framework for Responsible State Behavior in Cyberspace, which has four pillars. International law, norms, confidence building measures, and capacity building. Capacity building, in our opinion, under, undermines and supports the other three pillars. And I think that's important to understand. Personally, and I, uh, this is my position, that the cyber domain is unique. It is an environment where member states are only one of a number of stakeholders who have agency and equity in the issue. Private sector, civil society, academia, individuals, the internet belongs to all of us. And I think that's a difficult thing for member states to grapple with. These are multilateral fora, but the stakeholders themselves need to be given meaningful participation, which is the next point. Canada is a strong supporter of meaningful multi-stakeholderism. And I think if you talk to many of the stakeholders who follow the first committee, I think we, we walk the talk. 21st century is about digital transformation, and this is a wickedly complex problem, which I also will consider omnidirectional, which means it, it's multi-sectoral, it's basically playing 3D chess, which makes it also very difficult to deal with one thing at a time. You have to deal with many things in many different ways. This is going to be further amplified as we start talking about digital transformation in a development context. So rising digitalization plus rising, rising cyber interdependence and a borderless nature of the internet means it's a common, there are common threats and common risks. So every member state has, should have an interest in every other member state's cybersecurity. And it's only going to increase as countries seek to transform their societies, their economies uh, for the 21st century. And so in short, I would say to me is Canada is open to listening, open to engaging, and to consider anything that comes forward in this sense. Uh, having just sort of had a, a bit of a pre preview to uh, what the ICC is putting out, I think failure to do otherwise is a failure to walk the talk. It is a difficult conversation. If you talk to people who are pure cybersecurity specialists who sit in that world, they're often very reticent to talk about development in this context. But what I would simply say is, Every time you take a step forward on the digital development pathway, you're opening yourselves to further risks, undermining the systems that have to be secure in order to keep the rest of us secure. And in that sense, it's a common outcome. And that, I would simply say, is the transversal nature of the problem. And I'll just simply finish by saying, I think, and I, this is my sort of coined term, is we're in a sort of drive to 2025. We're in a, in a very interesting three-year period where there are several multilateral processes covering a vast number of digital cyber and tech governance issues that are all interrelated. And so I sort of put that forward to simply say, as we think about these conversations, you need to be thinking about 2025 and the outcomes that we're looking for. The SDG review coming up in 2023, the Summit of the Future 2024, WISIS Plus 20 2025. These discussions need to progress. And this is, I think, one of the things that at least in the two years I've been doing IGF is there's a lot of talk not a lot of walk. And I think that's where I believe the ICC is trying to take us. So I'll simply stop there. Thank you very much, David. Um, it was certainly short and sincere. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I think that sincerity uh, could be uh, the ethos of developing cyber development goals as well, because as you said, we are going to have um, difficult conversations. Um, especially, I think we're going to have difficulty speaking uh, a common language, as you said, um, because we are a bit divided between the development policy people, between the cybersecurity policy people, um, the capacity building um, organizations, the businesses. We all think we're doing something, but how can we bring that together to speak a common language? And, and, and really walk the talk, because I think we are looking at the same goals, uh, but we need to find a way um, to get all of us behind the same goals and, and, and get there together. Um, so Kaya, um, it's, you're the last one on the panel, but the, not the last one to speak today, for sure. Um, I wonder if, um, if you want to bring us back to what the private sector hopes um, 
the CDGs could be, or, and what do you see as opportunities, and what do you see as challenges from from a company that is heavily involved uh, um, in, in in cybersecurity discussions? Um, where do you see the CDGs um, helping, and and where there are any challenges with that? Yeah, and thank you. And um, again, uh, like Renee, sorry that I can be there. Um, I think from a private sector perspective, but I think. I would, I, you know, I would actually echo what you just said, which is we all, I think, probably have very similar goals. We just look at it from slightly different perspectives, and we we don't always use the same language. And I think that therein is where the opportunity for the cyber de development goals lies. I, I don't necessarily think that there would be anything that I would say that would uh, be in in competition or it would uh, contradict anything that um, you know any of the previous speakers have talked about. I think we all want a greater um, a greater cybersecurity and greater stability of the online environment. I think we at the same time we all also want to ensure that um, we continue to make progress in bringing more and more people online and not just bringing more people online but also um, getting more and more people adopted, uh, adopting new technologies. So, um, and, and finding new ways of using them uh, purposely and usefully, effectively for, for the society. Um, and to do that in a safer way. Um, as it was mentioned, there's a lot of ongoing initiatives at the moment that like that focus on cybersecurity capacity building whether it's the work that is being done through the GFCE, which we also are very proud to support. I agree with you, Thimea, I think it's the, the premier body for cybersecurity capacity building, um, or others, you know, different initiatives sponsored and, and um, advanced by both governments and the private sector and, and often implemented by civil society and academia. Again, you know, as it was mentioned, I think this is one of the areas that kind of needs to bring all the different stakeholders together for it to succeed. Um, and this is where I think, um, but I think there are a lot of very different initiatives that there are still, even though uh, with the efforts of the GFCE, still not necessarily coordinated or aligned to the extent that they could be. And so I think the cyber development goals, um, you know, as initially envisioned, and of course, this is a continued conversation, um, as far as I understand, really focused on the, the, the implementation of some of the agreements that have been adopted by states at the United Nations, and, you know, as a core framework that drives some of those, uh, um, some of those um, implementations, I think something that would be a useful rallying call to action. Um, both in terms of, you know, an aspirational goal that states um, should um, should um, should strive to in terms of where they want to advance their um, cybersecurity journey to, um, as well as a, a goal to focus funding for um, these issues. That I think funding across the board in this space is still sorely needed. And, um, and as well as sort of a, a process that allows progress to be measured a little bit more. I think at the moment, a lot of the conversations that, that are happening at, the, at, at sort of the international level are at a very abstract level, um, figuring out how some of those goal, how some, some of those agreements I, I should actually be implemented um, um, in, in, in real life. Um, and also then measuring progress towards those, I think it's something that the goals could really meaningfully do. Um, I would say that's not to say there's not a lot of work being done already. I think um, Canada, because as David just talked, has been driven, has been driving a lot of fantastic work around trying to get countries on board to understand what implementation of some of those things would be. But I think we need to take a step further and we need to also um, then work uh, with the, the civil society industry um, development community, which is, I think, often really sorely missing from the cybersecurity discussions. We tend to be driven um, largely by 
either technologist or national security uh, uh, specialist, and, and, and unpack them, figure out how they could be most usefully uh, applied in a particular domestic context to advance the development of those countries. I'm going to stop here, uh, but, uh, but happy to take any questions as we go on. Thank you very much, Kaya. Um, that's I noted um, the three things that that you said um, here quickly on 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 my notepad um, of what the the goals should strive to be and and what what they should accomplish and um, I like how you framed it. It's an aspirational goal that states should advance to uh, while being something that that helps us um, also track our progress. Um, and, and measure what we've achieved um, and then of course think about how those goals can be translated into our needs um, for, for funding and resourcing um, these activities be that capacity building or anything else that, that we need um, towards the implementation of, of shared uh, norms and objectives. Um, so we've heard from, from the panel but and before we turn to the audience and by the way for those of you online I'm not sure if you can see us uh, but we're almost standing room only, um, so I hope there will be a lot of uh, interventions from the audience. But before I turn to that, I want to make sure that the panel has time uh, and opportunity to react to each other's statements. So I'm just going to go in the same order as we've um, taken the floor before um, and just throw the ball um, back to everyone to react to what you've heard from each other and if there's anything you want to compliment, challenge or question each other about. Grace. I think for me, I, I still want to, um, the second speaker, I forget uh, his name, but he did articulate the same thing that I raised, the need to have uh, trust in such processes. So I think this is going to be critical uh, so that we don't undermine this process because it's a good process. The proposals are good and ideal. And if they worked, uh, we'd actually start seeing a more safer cyberspace. So the question then, and uh, that's probably one of the things that we need to hear from audiences, how then do we ensure that there is trust in this process? That's, that's um, a really good question for any process, I feel. Um, that needs to be, uh, even if we claim it is multi-stakeholder, I, I think the fact that we are here and before we even started anything, um, are trying to invite your views and input um, and the sincerity that, that um, David mentioned earlier, I think that, that helps in creating trust, but then we, ooh, sorry, we need to walk the talk for sure um, as we progress with, with this initiative um, and making sure that, that everything is transparent and inclusive um, and um, really helps um, bring people along the journey. Um, Renee, uh, Grace sort of threw the ball to you. What do you have to add? Well, I mean, I guess I can speak for ICC specifically here, um, aside of, of calling for this initiative and asking for different stakeholders to participate in this process. From an ICC perspective, also to be extremely clear, this process and the, the importance of these goals is kept separate from whatever position ICC might have on any of the substantive points. We are not trying to use this process as a way to sneak in our substantive position on different issues. We, of course, have other interests, but we need to clear, keep them clearly separate from when we have uh, views on particular goal, how it is best achieved, and the, the need of having goals and, and having a, a common approach. So I think from, from, from the business side here, this is a, a very clear distinction to keep those two separate. Then, of course, moving beyond, beyond ourselves here, Again, we, 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 we are coming here with, with a sincere uh, proposal. We believe that it is necessary to achieve success. Looking at the speed of uh, the unfortunate cyber de negative cyber development, the cost it creates to the society. I'm not talking about business cost here only. I'm talking about the society cost. We are now already at 5.5 trillion euros globally. And if we get to another uh, doubling of this cost uh, to 11 trillion, uh, which may happen within the next five years, the economies of three G7 uh, countries, uh, nominal GDP will be evaporated. So the, the enormous cost to societies, uh, this development is incurred. I think that we don't have the luxury here not to make sure that this is not 
going to be successful. Thank you, Renee, and thank you also for putting this uh, conversation into uh, the broader perspective of, of what, what this means in terms of uh, not just monetary costs, but, but um, otherwise as well for, for um, business and society. Um, the next speaker um, we've had, I'm sorry, there's some feedback. I hope everybody's on mute. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to, to turn to, to Jacqueline and ask, um, we've talked a lot about capacity building and how that links up with, um, with the cyber development goals. How can that move into creating trust in this process? Um, and how do you see some of your initiatives that you mentioned earlier linking up with this? Or anything else you want to add? <laughs> All right. I, I was already on the uh, train of, th of thoughts of responding to what everybody said. I don't think there's any, you know, rebuttal to what has been said here by the other panelists. Um, as David has said, this really is a 3D chess game <laughs> that is as complex as, you know, one could think of um, just because there is, you know, you have to think about the technical institutional and policy capabilities that you have to create um, to to ensure, you know, to, to achieve any level of cyber re resilience. Um, so how do we, you know, in practical terms, then bring all the multi-stakeholders multi around the table to develop these goals. I think this is going to be a very exciting process um, uh, to, of, you know, of, of getting to something that we agree on is bare minimum, um, and then having the review processes, um, and then obviously having to um, escalate and add to uh, once some of the goals have been uh, met. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, the activities that are already in, we've talked about this i think a little bit uh there's already a lot going on in cyber capacity building um you know the gfc is not the only uh, is uh, platform um and i see that a lot of the panelists actually were here now that um kaya was talking about uh canada um uh, are already doing a lot in that sense um but it's you know it's is it sufficient? Um, is it enough coordinated? Could we um, uh, get better visibility on what we're doing? Um, so to mobilize um, more players onto what we're already doing? I think that is the question going forward. Um, as the GFCE, we are taking a, I'd say, you know, three-step approach um, to supporting um, capacity building um, and linking it with development. Um, so on one level, we're working on political endorsement. It's important that at the highest level, you do have buy-in um, from those that do make decisions. Um, and as an example, next year, we will be hosting the Global Conference on Cyber Capacity uh, Building, GC3B. Um, and this will be um, a conference where we're bringing the development community as well as um, uh, the cyber uh, capacity building community. Um, and the idea is for us to start looking at how we can uh, complement each other, work together, and think of this as a one package um, as opposed to two uh, dividing sectors. Uh, if anyone is interested in that, you can go to gc3b.org um, and register to find out more about venue location date. Um, I'm sorry to be doing this advertising here. <laughs> it already op occurred in the open forum. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we are also working on national frameworks. And so we work on with governments to, um, and with our partners and members of the GFC community um, to support legal reforms um, within countries um, to adopt these international norms um, into instruments that are feasible, um, tangible uh, at a national scale. Um, and then lastly, we also have uh, more, I would say, tangible actions that we work on um, that directly support nation states, um, and especially with the using of uh, existing resources and initiatives, et cetera, um, that can complement and, and give the capacity that is needed um, to, um, to 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 achieve or to promote or um, to be able to to foster a, an open and free and secure internet as we've been talking about so the, you know the the conversation yeah it's it's com it's very complex um, but uh, and it needs to be had in various fora um, and needs to be broken down into 
various instruments which, which can be understood by you know a multi stakeholders so everybody in society um, so yeah I think I'll end there thanks Jacqueline um, and uh, I actually like two very um, concrete pieces from what you've said um, one in, in mobilizing the players uh, and one making sure that we talk to one another um, and I think that echoes through the discussions everywhere and, and speaking of an echo <laughs> here's my feedback it might be my phone let's see is it my phone it is, it is my phone no it's not my phone <laughs> Oof. Maybe, someone else's maybe it's someone else's phone are we all on mute i'm sorry I, I hope this this is okay is no it's not yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Is it off? Yeah, it is this. Sorry, everyone's the interpretation device, I think. Um, but um, interferes with the microphone. Apologies for that. Um, so anyway, in, in, in that, in that um, way of, of, of talking to one another and, and mobilizing every community and bringing everyone together, thank you for mentioning um, the event as well. I, I'm sure that's going to be an opportunity for us to have more discussions like this um, and we will try and do more in between as well um, but um, while we are thinking about that uh, David what do you think uh, that we can do more sure and so as they say brevity is the soul of wit um, yes there's a lot of issues um, look I could spend an hour telling you all you know rhyming off you heard yesterday UNECA's report 20 billion dollars it cost in cybercrime on the African continent in the last 10 years 128 billion Latin America in the same period, 2.9 billion unconnected. Many of the countries in Africa are, are dealing with such a wide spectrum of issues. You know, just getting them online is is is. You know, look, the analog development issues that we're dealing with in some parts of the world, before you even start talking about the digital ones, they're not resolved. And so this is where I think it's demanding more from your own governments in terms of looking at these issues in, in a more holistic manner. You know, we we attend these meetings at the multilateral level. There is a wide divergence of how these issues should be resolved, and that sometimes is what creates the, the, the friction and slows things down. And so this notion of high speed, low drag, we don't have the time, as, as, as the previous speaker Renee says, we're not meeting the SDG goals. And there is a notion that digital will help accelerate that, but in that is, in, is a, the risk and the threat in and of itself, it lies in that very statement. You start to digitalize farming, you don't have to start to worry about how you protect your data, how you move the data, where does that data go, data flow, so it's just a continuum of problems that governments have to resolve and that doesn't even bring in the bottom up process which is you go to smaller communities across the country, they have very different problems that they're trying to resolve and that those need to be pushed up so that when we get to the table and negotiate these things at the large framework multilateral level that they are fully imbued by these kinds of problems. Canada, other countries um, are there to discuss um, we want Africa at the table. I hear it a hundred times if I've heard it once. Africa wants in on the discussion. They don't want to be just takers. They want to be part of the process that makes the decisions. And I think that's a really strong message that you need to bring to your own governments. We're there to help. There's you know, a thousand points of light, which is always the problem. There's, if there's one capacity building process, there's a hundred of them. And it's, they're all available. They're sometimes a little unorganized or less, less optimally organized, but it's there. And Canada wants to work with countries who want to work with us. But it comes with a, a framework and a paradigm through which we will uh, deploy our resources. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, this, this, this is, I think, you, you really hit the nail on the head on, on needing to have a holistic view of the issues um, and, and having these multi-stakeholder processes to help achieve goals at a high level need to be then replicated um, down at the at the bottom uh, level really uh, in national context and in sub-national context um, to have all the stakeholders who want to work together uh, be part of the conversation not just the conversation but the decision and the implementation as well and can the goals help bring we, we've said um, we are working towards the same ideas. We we all want a safer, uh, more resilient cyber system. We all have various ideas on how to get there. So can the goals help shine a common beacon towards we all with which we all are heading? Like the SDGs have done a 
for the development um, question, can the CDGs be that common rallying call um, for, for us to, to know where we're headed um, and then maybe make the road a little clearer um, together? Uh, Kaya, on the account of the last word from the panel again, um, what do you think? No, I mean, it's it's hard to, you know, I feel like we're all like in wild agreement. So I think it's always difficult to uh, to sort of have have something uh, intelligent to add when that happens. I think it's, um, I would just basically say, uh, you know, we need to work together. Uh, we need to all um, agree that's more than needs to be done. And, uh, you know, whether it's the cyber development goals, whether it's a diff, you know, a different venue, like the GFC conference that was mentioned, you know, potentially those two together. Um, I think a rallying cry to uh, sort of expand the understanding that really a lot more needs to be done on cybersecurity um, across the board. Um, um, you know, I think that understanding needs to be expanded outside this room and outside the people on the call. Because I feel like I think we are all we are all convinced. I think we're all believer believers, but uh, there's others that still need to uh, understand the importance of this subject. Thank you, Kaya. Let's go global. <laughs> I hope we can do that. Um, and and then I would love to hear from everybody in this room, and and not just in the in the room, but I see people online are already asking for the floor. Um, thank you. I will get to you very very soon. I just want to make sure that we know who we are talking to. So um, while we are enabling the cameras for. Um, uh, the Bangladesh Remote Hub technical uh, team, please, and and uh, um, and Basma Tafik, who also will want to take the floor online, please enable video and camera and 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 mics for them. In the meantime, I just want to do a quick raising the hand exercise in the room and see who we are representing. So, who here is from government? One, two, okay. Who here is from business? Who here is from a technical organization? Okay. And who here is from civil society? I think everybody else. <laughs> Great. So, so it is a multi-stakeholder group already here, so that we all know who we are representing and um, and, and and working with. Um, it's I think already a testament to this idea of trust and inclusiveness. Uh, I hope we can continue on in the same way. Um, so I saw two questions here in the room. I want four questions here in the room. Five. Okay, so I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five back in the room, and then we're going to go online, um, and then I'm going to back to the to the speakers to see who wants to take the question. So number one. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fiona Songa, Chief Executive Officer of the Technology Service Providers Association of Kenya, and uh, mine was. A quick recap when having the conversation, um, it was important, I think, for us to hear from a tech speaker because the challenge with cybersecurity is that everybody else ex expects that the tech companies will be the ones ensuring everything works, which, from a technical point of view, we do. But we do not have the capacity to go in and do the public capacity building. We will basically enable everybody to understand what they need to do. If I can just use a few examples quickly. Um, you all have phones, you all use your phones. You all know how to go online and download applications and do everything using your phones. The one thing a lot of people do not do, because in this part of the continent, the phone is the device that we're using for online and digital transactions. The one thing that is not paid attention to is the details of the different apps we are, that have been downloaded. So the app guys have already done everything and put it out there. But getting people to spend time to read the instructions, the blueprint, it, it's, it, it needs, we need more than just tech pushing for that. So I like the idea of the, the goals because then within that we begin to have standard ways of trying to ensure that we don't just have, we have a lot of skilled people People can go online, they can use computers, they can use their phones, but they are not knowledgeable. What I mean is they don't take time to read, understand the pros and cons, and what, what the apps allow you to do, what the app developers allow you to do, what the platforms can let you do, what the infrastructure will allow you to do, for example. And so we have a lot of people globally online 
with a skill to get online but without the knowledge and the aspect of knowledge cannot be a tech industry thing why because it's very difficult to even try and run advertisements in the public domain trying to get people to understand when you get a text message from someone saying that they are injured they are kidnapped they are something don't just send money everybody must have there must be people pull around call check find out we may think it's common sense but it is not so we have a lot of things, and that is how cyber security in Africa is really thriving. You use your visa card, you take the receipt, you just throw it. Someone somewhere will pick that card, and with the last digits of your visa card, it's actually possible to get the full number of your card, and to get the security code, and to transact with your card online. How do we behave as individuals? And this is really on a user basis, and these are the things that the tech companies may not have time to teach in the public domain and I think within there right lies a role for civil society partnering with governments and pushing for that knowledge adoption because the challenge and the losses in cyber security when we work with we are part of first the forum for international incident response teams we have very clear processes very clear procedures within that we are very clear on how to handle things we are very clear on dealing with uh, government security agencies and who gets what information as a tech sector but the public engagement is where the rubber hits the road thank you Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very important and I think a very eloquent um, addition to what we've been talking about. Who was number two? Uh, there. Thank you very much, uh, our presenters and uh, the moderator as well. Uh, my name is Iyob Satu. Um, I'm executive director for Organization for Innovation and Sustainable Development Africa. Um, <coughs> I mean, I have some uh, reflections uh, on the cyber security and the global norm uh, for data protection. And, and I'll, I'll try to raise some examples of Ethiopia and the recent um, time in which uh, the country faced with the cyber insecurity in relation to the um, very recent conflict. So, um, actually, um, we have to focus on uh, on, the, on the security of, of, of the digital facilities as, as we accelerate the digital infrastructures all over the world. Um, uh, for the case of uh, Ethiopia, in only 2021, uh, Ethiopia encountered uh, a cyber attack of 2,850. Uh, actually uh, successfully protected it. That was very tr a great treat for uh, banks and the financial institutions at the realm of war. Um, when uh, we come to uh, the issue of cybersecurity, it's also more related with, as my sister raised, the issue of trust that is more related with the political um, um, commitments and really the the political security of that country that for instance um, the outgoing party was taking the whole data set of the country but it was really um, saved through a backup saving of the various um, um, data so uh, that's uh, mainly uh, the, the the physical infrastructure of of the cyber security has to be given more attention as you all raising the issue of coordination and the really uh, stakeholder cooperation uh, that this optical uh, fever uh, which mostly comes across the uh, terrestrial bodies um, has to be secured from various um, terrorists and cyber crimes so um, this really needs um, a great attention to make it a secure and a safe world but my final question um, for my friend uh, here uh, among the finalists is um, yeah um, I mean you raised good uh, issues but w what should the global norm uh, look like so that to ensure the global and uh, regional cyber resilience Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Who was number three? We're going to speed through it. Okay. Um, three was me. It was you three? Okay, and then we're going to go to you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dauda. I am from Senegal and I'm a cybersecurity specialist. Thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity to attend this, uh, this panel. And uh, I would say that setting up goals and implementing international norms uh, to protect cyber users is, is important and is great. But I have some concerns. Um, the first one is, uh, are we going to um, harmonizing cybersecurity laws because this will impl implicate laws? Okay, and uh, n knowing that um, the reality on the ground uh, may differ from country to country, and then uh, uh, I would say collaboration within those countries uh, remains a big challenge. Uh, the second one is uh, implementing those norms uh, are still important, and uh, the most beneficiaries will be us, like end users. But some countries will be reluctant on the implementation. So how you do, guys, as a, as a community, uh, will handle those issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, there, and then, yeah, <laughs> and then there. Uh, I would ask you to please try and be very brief, because I also have three questions online I want to get to. Please go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? All right. So. My name is Elrui, and I am here with an organization called National ID Ethiopia. So it is um, basically a government program that aims to digitalize the current identification of the citizens of Ethiopia. So it also is based upon the principles from the Identity for Development, which is uh, which are stated in the Identification for Sustainable Development, and. So what it's trying to solve is the inclusivity and the removing barriers to accesses to barriers to access for everybody through inclusion practices and principles. So that this is a huge step for the cyber development of Ethiopia since uh, this is a, a very recent program and it's it's also an op opportunity as well as a threat as you guys have said and. The CIA tried, so I'm a computer science student, so I'm, I'm more familiar with the technical aspect and the technical threats that come with the cyber identification and the cyber development. And the CIA tried is not very known by the people of Ethiopia. And so even the, U, the concept of the UIN, the unique identifier that's uh, in the national ID is a foreign concept. We never had that in this country before. So the people are not very sure about the security of it and the harm that would cause if it's shared with people. There's also the social engineering aspect, and which is a culture here. And so my, um, well, I would suggest, this is, I have a suggestion and a question. So I would suggest that uh, the cyber development goals should um, take into consideration the developing countries and how uh, it's not a common concept. I mean, a lot of people are not well educated about the, the idea of cybersecurity, the idea of cyber crime. Uh, they are not well aware of the issues that would come with uh, sharing their unique identifiers. And as we walk towards uh, cyber development, there are also going to be many issues in the future. And so uh, I think that would be a good place to start considering developing countries like Ethiopia. So my question is uh, based upon my suggestion how how do you intend to handle the digital divide that exists between the several countries represented here uh, because some of the concepts you have raised are a bit foreign it's a foreign concept in the context of ethiopia so how do you intend to implement that really in countries like ethiopia thank, thank you, you very much for bringing in that very very important context i've had a lady in the back and then sir here you, you go in the in the yellow yeah you in the yellow shirt please go ahead uh, could you come up to the microphone somewhere there's a free seat right over here thank you for sharing your seat <laughs> hi everyone my name is Nancy Hi everyone, my name is Nancy from North America School of Internet Governance and I have two questions for any of the panel speakers. 
How can countries ensure accountability for cyber attacks that breach international laws and norms? And my second question is, how can the civil society organizations contribute to protecting our cyber spaces? This is from both developed countries and developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being brief, sir. OK, thank you. <coughs> my name is Tasfai. Uh, from Ethiopia, from uh, uh, Federal Judiciary. I'm a Vice President for Federal First Instance Court and a spokesperson for Ethiopian Federal Courts. Uh, I have two, 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 two questions um, and maybe one suggestion. Uh, this cybercrime, as you have stated, that we need to have a global norms for cybersecurity, uh, but uh, having uh, norms is not enough uh, because there needs to be uh, a legal instrument that makes uh, countries accountable. Uh, I think the United Nations is tabling a treaty for having an international treaty or a convention to, uh, to, 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 to combat cyber crimes. And we have this uh, uh, Budapest Convention in Europe and we in Africa have, uh, the African Union has also enacted uh, cyber uh, crime uh, uh, conventions. Therefore, what needs to be done in order to harmonize uh, different uh, uh, regions, conventions, in order to combat these cyber crimes? Because these cyber crimes are uh, conducted uh, uh, in different in different countries. They don't have a border, and the cost, the economic cost of cyber crimes, as you know it well, is so staggering. Therefore, combating uh, cyber crime is very critical. Therefore, different countries, different regions should come together by having uh, a common conventions under the United Nations uh, umbrella. Therefore, what are the activities that has been carried out maybe at the United Nations level? The second one is um, uh, uh, doing this awareness. Awareness building is, I think, is very important. But uh, we need to be also sure that the justice sectors are participating uh, in, in, in cyber crimes uh, combating. Uh, therefore, how we are going to detect crimes, how we are going to prosecute crimes, and how the judiciaries are, uh, are, 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 are uh, adjudicating cyber crime cases are very critical. Therefore, uh, capacity building for justice sector professional for judges pro for prosecutors is I think is very important here in Ethiopia we have uh, cyber crime proclamations and uh, cyber computer crimes laws but the capacity the knowledge I think on that area is very meager therefore the support I think on those areas is very important thank you Thank you very much, sir. I hope the panelists are keeping up with all the questions and, and suggestions here. I, I do want to make sure that we go to our online um, uh, attendees as well. So um, Bangladesh Remote Hub, uh, are you ready online to, to ask your question? Can you enable your camera? Can we have your microphone at least? So we would need the mic for Bangladesh Remote Hub to um, then to Basma Tafik and then to uh, Rob Collett. My colleague is coming up to show you which those speakers are. If you can please help us with that. While we're trying to figure that out um, with the tech crew, I'm just going to turn to the panel for a quick. Somebody wants to respond, maybe, to all what we've heard. Mm. I give it a try. David, please. Said I love the microphone. So. Knowledge is to know that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is to know it doesn't go in a fruit salad, <laughs> right? And so I, it is a bit of the problem is, is once you start the journey to, you, digital inclusion is about, you know, educating your citizenry, giving them the tools, giving them the ability to get online so that they can better enable and take from the digital uh, transformation benefit. And I think that's sort of, uh, I think when uh, and Fiona sort of made that at the very beginning, Without going into a very long and complex uh, answer, member states, you know, uh, there are obligations that are positive and negative legal obligations that member states have signed up to. Not all member states uh, follow that. The 2015 uh, report uh, articulated 11 norms of state behavior. 
Not all member states follow those norms of state behavior. So it's again, it's a bit about walking the talk and talking the walk. Um, and, and I think it partly goes to the question of we don't always need more treaties. We ha actually don't know whether the current international law, how it applies in the digital space. We don't know, you know, does inter how does international humanitarian law apply in the current context before we start talking about needing something new. So there's a sort of this notion of uh, having to reinvent something before we've actually taken a hard look at what's already out there. And I think that's where we're at for many in the global north is we're much more sophisticated in the issues we're trying to deal with and I think it's f from countries like Canada to recognize in other parts of the world the problems that they're facing are much different maybe much more basic but nevertheless also crucial because they have to move up the value chain as well and I think this is where coming to Africa going to the, the global south hearing the problems that are actually the real problems here is crucial for us so when we go back and actually talk in New York because it's your, your countries don't necessarily um, articulate the same problems. This is why the multi-stakeholder model is extremely crucial. Private sector is extremely important to the security of many of our countries, to the citizens who live in their countries. They're not necessarily, they don't have a voice at the UN First Committee, but they're a part of the solution. And so how do we, how do we bring them into the fold, into the conversation to find the solutions? Same thing for civil society. I'll stop there. Thank you, David. I think colleagues in Bangladesh are ready to ask their question. Hello from Addis. Am I on Yes, we. Yes, you are. Hey, thanks for giving us the opportunity. I said that's a bad charge. We are Bangladesh United. We are operating Bangladesh United from 2020 now. By the initiative of Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum, we are also working and working with the event and kids ICT in Bangladesh from 2021. This year, our kids ICT is a success locally and internationally. As we believe that kids are our backbone for leading the next generation ICT. So we would like to ask our questions. We have sorts of cyber security rules and simultaneous fee. Is that every government has a rules to lead it? How can we mutualize two parallel rules by ICT? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bangladesh. We've had a little bit of feedback as you were speaking, so I would very much appreciate if you could just uh, reconfirm your question in the chat. So, so I'm sure that uh, I'm asking the panel is the right thing. Um, in the meantime, can we please go to um, who is next in line? Um, we've had uh, Basma Tafik. If I pronounce your name correctly, you have the floor. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Hello, thank you so much. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the Basma topic. Uh, yes, you're spelling uh, correctly. Uh, speaking from the government of Egypt, I'm um, working in the International Policies Department. Uh, uh, I have uh, one question uh, regarding the conversation and discussions uh, uh, been held uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, I do agree and thank everyone for their presentations and uh, uh, for their uh, for their goal to have a, a cybersecurity development goal. Uh, I have just a question regarding the implementation of this goal, uh, um, taking into consideration that uh, the cybersecurity differentiates from a country to another. Uh, yes, we do have, we do agree that uh, everyone is aware of the cybersecurity issue, but still, as my first uh, colleague mentioned in her first question regarding the knowledge, we still uh, have a problem in knowledge. So how can we implement these goals, uh, taking into consideration the difference between the countries? Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us from Egypt. Um, uh, last question I see online, Rob, call it, please. Hello, hi, thank you. Uh, my first question is, um, how can we get involved in this process in terms of next steps, if we'd like to support it? And the second is, are the cyber development goals that you're proposing limited to supporting what has already been agreed at the UN in terms of norms of good government behavior? Or are they going wider to how cybersecurity is needed to implement all of the 17 uh, current SDGs and potentially future new SDGs? Thank you for that question. Before you uh, go away, could you just please uh, remind ourselves, uh, remind us where you are from and, and who do you represent, just so we can note that. Oh, hi. Uh, so my name is Robert Collett. 
Um, I'm uh, with Chatham House as an associate fellow, and I'm also uh, supporting the Global Conference on Cyber Capacity Building next year as an advisor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm just going to read out quickly the question that, that Bangladesh asked, um, so we're sure that we've heard it well in this room. Um, they say, we have sorts of cybersecurity rules and simultaneously each and every government has a, a rules to lead it. How can we mutualize two parallel rules uh, by the IGF? Um, so these last three sets of questions, um, turning to the panel, who would like to answer that? And if I can volunteer Renee to answer that last one, that would be great. Um, but anybody else? Please, Grace. Okay, uh, there was a sorry, there was a question that uh, was raised on uh, on uh, what civil society can do uh, to support. Um, cybersecurity uh, initiatives, and, and I think this is already happening. Uh, one of the things that civil society is doing is actually raising awareness um, interventions. So there are several civil society organizations raising awareness uh, on, C on, on cybersecurity and how it affects our ordinary people. Um, for example, I will say like at Kicktonet, we actually have been working with uh, ordinary people like farmers, like women in all their diversities, in raising awareness on social engineering and how they should be, they shouldn't be culpable of, of especially when they are using mobile uh, money transactions. And so, uh, one of the things that happens is that. Of course, there's that uh, raising awareness, and there's also um, uh, initiatives to train them on 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 cyber hygiene approaches, cyber hygiene um, uh, cyber hygiene uh, practices, uh, because what we are pushing for is for these ordinary people to adapt cyber hygiene practices uh, similar in similar way that we washed our hands during COVID, we sanitized during COVID, we kept uh, social distance during COVID. And so, you know, just creating uh, knowledge products that then can be utilized by ordinary citizens and support knowledge creation for those ordinary citizens. So civil society is doing it, but uh, there's still so much space uh, for more to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, Renee, I volunteered you to answer that last question. How can people get in touch with us? Um, how can they contribute to the process? Um, and what are we, how far are we um, thinking of going uh, with, with the CDGs? Yes, well, thank you for those questions. And I mean, just to first to underline the point that some previous speaker only mentioned, there are many things out there already. This is not about reinventing, reinventing, uh, for example, the discussion of norms or some of the great initiatives that have been been discussed and presented today. I think that this is uh, number one. Uh, so this is not a new thing to to compete or duplicate anything. Uh, the second observation I make is that while there are many good things happening in different silos, we need to connect the dots. And uh, the other aspect of that, that we need also some kind of sense of common destiny. And I think that's where the objectives or the goals come into play, that we want to achieve certain things in terms of tangible outcomes. So I would say the key, key aspects here are to consider is to not to duplicate or reinvent, but rather to, to connect uh, initiatives and put a sense of agreed uh, ambition or direction what needs to be achieved within those different areas where the ultimate objective is to make improvement, tangible improvements in the real life. So I would say that that's, that's the, 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 the ideas we have. And of course, that multi-stakeholder process and the involvement is critical, not only for, for trust, which and I only I don't mean in, in any demeaning way, but is that I don't believe there is anyone who sits with the answers here that can can say, well, this is what we should, should do, even if, 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 if we wanted to look somewhere. So I think the collective collaborative fashion is a necessity 
not only for trust building, but also actually to come with something that will make tangible changes by working with most of what is already out there, but, but putting some agency and sense of direction. So I think this would be, be my answer. In terms of how to get involved, um, ICC will make an outreach and, and please do uh, to make contacts with, with the people on the ground here today. Uh, but we will invite uh, participants, uh, stakeholders, governments for this process. And our ambition is to convene stakeholders uh, and, and, and start discussing how we can take con concrete and concise steps towards the a development or agreement of which goals are important, outcomes-based uh, out, uh, objectives that are necessary to change facts on the ground, and to which kind of goals do we need to have in place so we connect different dots of those great initiatives that are already, already in place. And possibly on the margin, there will be also maybe those that haven't been connected yet, which we uh, find out need to be connected for, for the overall approach to work. But again, that will be a consequence of a missing piece, not uh, an ambition on its own. Thank you very much, Renee. We have three minutes on the clock remaining in the workshop. So on that note of inviting collaboration and outreach, I just want to uh, let you know we, you, we will find us at the International Chamber of Commerce. So we are at iccwbo.org. Um, you'll find my contact details there as well. You'll find me on LinkedIn. There's also a space in the IGF website where you find the description of this session, um, where you can provide feedback um, on the session. Um, so there's various ways to get in touch. Um, I'm, I, us, we will be here till the end of the event. So um, if I can volunteer also my fellow panelists, I'm sure that they can be um, reached out to uh, for further questions. Um, and instead of me trying to make sense of this all, uh, I'm just going to give you the three words that I think I've heard that are most important and I will ask uh, my fellow panelists to do the same. Um, I've heard trust, I've heard a need for inclusion, um, and I've, need, uh, I've heard the need for action. So um, I, I think uh, under the global uh, idea of, of covering the cyber development goals, um, I've heard that we need them. Um, there's a big question on, on how we're going to get there, uh, but trust, inclusivity, and, and collective action is, is what I take away from this conversation. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Kaya to go first and, and work backwards uh, from, from the list of speakers. Um, I would probably say, you just need three words, I'd probably, that's hard. Um, I'd probably say uh, trust, uh, partnership, um, and I, I, I mean, invitation for everyone to contribute, which is not really a word, more like a feeling, but that's kind of what I, I'm leave, leaving you with. Thank you very much. We, we, we feel that feeling here as well, I, I hope. It, it comes through the web. Um, going, going backwards then from, from my list of speakers, um, I'm going to go to um, David. Sure. Uh, well, let me say, just say thank you very much to everybody for participating. Uh, I'm here all week. You can find me. You can find me online. You can find me here. Uh, three words that I would say would be agency, direction, and outcomes. Very practical. Thank you, David. Um, Jacqueline. All right. Um, my three words would be dynamic, um, collaboration, and trust. There's a recurring theme there. Um, Renee, please. Have we lost Renee? Uh, no. Sorry, no, I had just some problem with my PC. No, I will just second that. I think collaboration is the key. All right, and Grace, you started us off. <laughs> Where do you want to finish? Trust, collaboration, and uh, trust, collaboration. I, f I forget the other word, I had rooted it. Okay, let me just remain with those two. I see I don't seem to find that. <laughs> Trust, collaboration, and engagement. And, engagement. Yeah. and let's continue the conversation. I think that's... <laughs> let's, let's end on that note. Thank you very much again for everyone for being here. Thank you for my fellow panelists. 
uh, for the preparation of this discussion and, and for the presentations that were brought here today. Thank you to all of you who were participating. And thank you for my wonderful team and my colleague Benny for making this all possible. Um, let's, uh, as my friend Dana and Vent you always say, see you on the web. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone online as well. Thank you.